you know, we're not just out there to to um, kill people just for the fun of it, but just to, you know, solve a problem. And, and that became a problem. There was no base. There's no like place you could go to call home. Home was wherever you dug your hole. And I do remember distinctly remembering like, you didn't want to let anyone down more so than anything. Like I would rather be sleepy than fall asleep and something bad happen. I had to remember who the fuck I was. Like you're a fucking Marine, you did all this stuff. You don't have to be down in the dumps. It's like, you know, stand up, do what you need to do to, 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 to be happy. And it's kind of, kind of that attitude of like, you know, it's not, it's not worth it to, to be down in the dumps. What's up, Rowan? Nothing. Here with Urban Valor. Here we are, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, uh, so let's just start it out with, uh, how about just introduce yourself, uh, tell everybody your name, um, branch of service you served with, um, what your job was, primary MOS, and then uh, what rank you got out of. Uh, Rowan Faisu. Uh, Joined in 1999, um, I was a 0351 assaultman uh, and a 8152 security guard. And I was assigned to 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines and Marine Corps Security Forces Banger. Um, I got out as a sergeant. I picked up sergeant a little less than a year before I got out. Right on, man. Um... All right, let's just uh, let's get into. Uh, uh, why don't you talk to me about um, where you're from, uh, where you were raised, and what your uh, upbringing was like? Okay, yeah, I was uh, I was born in Livingston, New Jersey. Um, we lived in New York City. Uh, after that, we had uh, for a couple years. I'm the youngest of well, I have. Two older siblings and a younger half uh, sibling, and I was uh, after we lived in New York for a couple years. Moved to Houston, Texas for a few more years after that, and then we moved to California, which I was pretty much been out here my whole life. Um, came out here in first grade. Uh, pretty much lived the whole time. Joined the Marine Corps in '99. Was stationed in Washington State, and then. Uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and uh, well, before we get into your military service, um, how many siblings do you say you have? Uh, three. three. I have a older sister, older brother, and a younger sister. So okay. my older sister is a nurse. My older brother is a, a doctor. My younger sister works with the internet. She's about ten years younger. My older sister is a one year older, and my older brother is about seven years older. And so we're all pretty local. My little sister lives in Brea. I, I live with my older sister. I live in the back house. She lives in the front house. And then my brother lives in Palm Springs. Okay. He, and he practices out there. Um, what, what was your family like growing up? Did, were you guys tight? Um, you know, were you a type of family that, you know, ate dinner together every night? Uh, what, yeah. What so since, since we had, since my mom had moved out here to California, uh, my parents had divorced in uh, while they were living in Texas, and so then she came out here. We were kind of alone, so basically our family out and out here in California is just limited to just us. It's just me and my siblings, and so um, it just so happened that when my mom had moved out here, a, a, a college like roommate had contacted her when she moved out here and invited her out to like some. Uh, like a family event for Christmas and Thanksgiving and whatnot. And that was like right when we moved out here. I'm not really sure, clear out how she got a hold of her, but um, they had lived out in uh, West Covina. And so all our holiday parties, all our, all our family stuff has been with them. And so that's like our family. But we were still living like 45 minutes away. So essentially like all the, all the, um, all our weekends, all our, all our, like, you know, nights were, it was us. It was just family, just me, my sister, my brother. And so that was like our upbringing. So we don't have like a whole, like a big family to, um, that we were seeing every, every weekend. It was just, it was just uh, us uh, as we grew up. 
Earlier, you told me that uh, your your pops is a, a military veteran. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, so my mom is uh, my mom's from the Philippines. My dad's from South Carolina. He had joined the the reserves, I think, in I like to say nineteen sixty two, and I remember him telling me about like especially during like the Vietnam era, like he thought he was going to get called up for sure, but he didn't actually end up getting called up. Uh, I think he was at some base in either Mississippi or Alabama. He was telling me it was where he went to like boot camp, but he was an army reserve cook. And, uh, I think he, I think he used a GI bill, he got his college degree and everything and kind of, uh, went that route of using the military, um, to further his education. And so he, he used it pretty well. He got an English degree uh, at Rutgers, a law degree at Seton Hall, and a, a medical doctorate degree. I'm not sure exactly where. Wow. <laughs> Lots of school, huh? Yeah, he had a, he had a ton of schooling, um, a lawyer and a doctor. Um. Did he, did he practice any of those, in any of those? Yeah, he, he didn't have any pressing law. He didn't, End up practicing law. He practiced uh, a lot of uh, he his his career was in uh, medicine. He did oncology, hematology, so cancer and uh, uh, kind of blood diseases, and that's kind of how I remember him. Is always uh, he was always busy. He was uh, he was like a, he was a man to emulate. Uh, probably he's the smartest man I ever met, by far. Um, my brother being the second smartest man I ever met. And, uh, but my dad had, he had, he had those degrees and then he was always a hard worker. Like you could, I could, I, I didn't really realize it till as I got older that how hard he like worked and, and like he was frugal, but only with himself. Never, never, uh, with others, he, he was, he was very generous. And so, uh, I remember like, I would help him clean his his uh, his office on the weekends. Like he didn't pay anyone to do it; he did it himself. Mm-hmm. He would take out the trash himself. He would he would clean his office himself. And I would and I remember the, the days that I visited him. He would I would uh, do that. I remember going to the hospital, and he would be doing his rounds on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so I just remember him always working, and he never complained. And never was never like. Oh, I got to go to work. It was just like I have to go to I have to go see my patients at the hospital real quick. So let me go do that. Mm. And so um, I don't ever remember him complaining. Just uh, just just worked, worked and never complained, and just uh, provided for his family. Sounds like he had a big heart. Very big heart, yeah. And 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 um, he had recently passed uh, about a year ago from COVID. He had some complications, and but. Um, a lot of it like came, you realize how, how big of a heart he had after he passed. Um, his, his, his wife was really kind. Uh, her name was Echo. And, and then we, um, when he had passed, she had given me every, everything. He had kept every letter I ever gave him. Wow. Every letter, every, every trinket, everything. And she had given it to me. And so that was kind of like a, a heartfelt thing. I was like, I didn't, I didn't even realize it, that he kept all those things. Wow. That's, I, yeah. That's awesome. I had a letter from like when I was, I, I don't ever remember writing it, but it must have been when I was about four or five years old. I barely read the writing. It was so, so scratchy. Well, sorry to hear about your dad, man. Thank you. Um, and your mom, how's she doing? My mom, uh, uh, she's doing okay. You know, um, she has like a, a kind of like a form of Parkinson's. So, um, She's on checkout status, uh, but uh, yeah, she 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 lived a good life. Uh, she was born, she was born in the Philippines, uh, about the time of the Bataan Death March, and so um, she had moved to she had moved to New York City when she was about twenty four, I think. I think she was about twenty four. Uh, been here ever since. Um, Moved to New York, and then we moved to Texas. Then we moved. Uh, she had she had uh, ended up divorcing my dad and moved out to California in '87. She was a chemist by trade. She had got her bachelor's degree in chemistry, and so um, growing up, she she was always working. I was kind of like a latchkey kid, um, 
she would go to work. She wouldn't get home till about 6.30 or something like that. And so, so we would, she would take us to school, but we would have to walk home, generally speaking, from all through life. Uh, she had a, I remember she was, a, she was kind of a clean freak. She always wanted us to clean the house. So we always had to have the house clean as soon as she got home. She was pretty strict on that. And so, but um, it wasn't very hard because, I mean, the house was already clean. All you had to do was vacuum the floor, put, put, vacuum the floor, put your things away. Uh, she, uh, she always uh, was able to take us on trips, which I really appreciate, you know. Not too many parents get to take their kids on vacation. And so a lot of the trips she went on that would, she would take us on were uh, to national parks. And so like I have an affinity for going for the outdoors nowadays. And so a lot of that is because of her. Awesome. I remember going to Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone. I remember going to Seattle, uh, Houston, New York. We went back to New York City. Uh, things like that so she really worked hard to at least provide some sort of like enjoyment for us nice that's awesome you got those memories with your parents yeah. then. um so what inspired you to, to go into the marine corps um my dad really didn't talk about his service much so i didn't really have any experience um knowing really anything about the military and i just remember um a classmate of mine one time was like I think he remembers it said something like, and it stuck with me like, oh, if you're, you know, the Marines are the badasses of, of the military. And I, I didn't, I didn't know anything about the military and I kind of looked it up and, uh, and I figured if I'm going to join the military, I might as well join, I might as well join the best branch. And so, uh, that was my thought process at the time. I was like, I'm, I'm not necessarily meant for school, at least not right now at that time. And then, so I figured I'd join the military. And so I was, if I'm going to join the military, I might as well join the Marines. And if I'm going to join the Marines, I might as well do the toughest job that they have. Nice. And so that was kind of like my thought process. So that's what I signed up for was, was the uh, infantry. Um, how old were you when you went to boot camp? I was 17. I turned 18 in boot camp. I joined there in August. I, my birthday is October 27th. So I think we finished. We had finished right uh, on the Thanksgiving weekend, and I remember we got actually got out. I know typically in boot camp you get out, uh, you graduate on Friday, but we had graduated that Wednesday. Oh wow! Yeah. So no, you didn't have no visitor Thursday or any of that, huh? I don't recall a visitor Thursday. Yeah. Huh. That was um, twenty-two years ago. So it's yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um. What was boot camp like for you? Was it a culture shock for you? Was it easy for you? I think I was kind of somewhat mentally prepared. I kind of, I maybe a couple of weeks before I had watched Full Metal Jacket and I was like, okay, well, that's what it's like. I think I could deal with that. And so it wasn't necessarily a culture shock. I figured you're going to get yelled at. You're going to have to do whatever it is they say. You're going to have to follow orders. So I kind of, I, I was kind of mentally prepared for it. Um, and and uh, what I remember of boot camp was uh, I was there in, like, like I said, August, September, October, November, or end of August. So it was September, October, November. It wasn't cold. It wasn't hot. It was actually kind of, the weather was kind of comfortable. So I didn't have to suffer in that sense. But um, I was always been kind of relatively lean and fit. And so a lot of the um, training sessions weren't, weren't the hardest. And so I was kind of, I was, I, I think more than anything, I was excited about it. I was excited to try and become a Marine and, and see if I could pass the test. That was probably the, the biggest thing. So, um, was it difficult? Yeah, I guess it was difficult at times, but I think I was, I was like mentally ready yeah. to, to make that transition of, in my life. Right on. Um, and then, uh, from boot camp, yeah, you said you were infantry. So did you go to a school of infantry? I did, uh, went to a school of infantry, Camp Pendleton, um, I can't remember where they told me what my job was going to be. I'm guessing it was Camp Pendleton where they told me I was going to be uh, an assault man. Um, but yeah, we got to Camp Pendleton. I think we waited a couple couple weeks to get picked up by the training company, did the training. I thought that was way harder than boot camp. I remember going on those range runs and dying. 
I thought I thought that I th- I think I think probably because I'm a smaller a smaller frame and I was much more smaller back then than I was now. I think I'm about 50 pounds heavier than I was back then, mm-hmm. and uh, I remember those those uh, range runs being difficult. Um, and but uh, and 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 it started to be into the winter winter season. It was like uh, December and January and being cold. I remember it being really cold in Camp Pendleton. It's got like a little little microclimate. Yeah. Like it's just I don't know for some reason it just feels so cold in the morning. Um, so we did our infantry training out there. I uh, we ended up uh, I did the ass- assaultment course. I think that was how long is infantry? Three, six weeks. You know I don't remember. I don't even remember. Yeah, I think it was about six. And six then to eight weeks, something like that. Six to eight, and then t- two weeks for the weapons training. And then after that, we went to security for school in where did Chesapeake? Chesapeake. Yeah. Chesapeake. Yeah. And that was that was cool. I was excited about that going out to the East Coast. You know, like I was born on the East Coast, so I kind of figured like, oh, you know, Chesapeake will be cool. It'll be East Coast. I'll be see what it's like. And and I remember getting out there is April, and I remember looking at the trees, and I could picture the trees in my head. They didn't have any leaves on them. And I didn't really, it was kind of foreign to me being from Southern California where it's always kind of relatively warm and it was kind of still cool out there in April. And then, uh, I remember checking in and then, uh, going to that school and school was, I think four, four weeks, six weeks, I don't know, four to right. six weeks or something like that. Stop asking me hard questions. bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's numbers. Uh, but yeah, I did that. It was, it, that was, that was a, that was a fun school. I thought that school was fun. Just kind of learning about that stuff, going through the, uh, the shooting drills and all that stuff, uh, and how to be like, um, be part of the anti-terrorism team. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then we got stationed at Banger. Um, what was Banger like for you? Banger, Washington, that is right. Yes, sir. Banger. It was, it was interesting. Um, I had uh, I had actually pissed fat, Fast Company as uh, when we were leaving security. You get to pick where you want to go. I had picked Fast Company. I didn't get it. So then my second choice was the West Coast Banger, and then um, so we went. I ended up getting Banger, and then I don't know. I had I had a lot of fun in Washington. Uh, I thought it was uh, um, a neat. Uh, well, the climate, the the place was pretty cool. I thought like. You know, trees. We don't have trees like that in, in in California. It was just like kind of something so different that was I I thought was really cool. And then um, uh, I had a uh, I got assigned a second platoon in Banger. Um, met a met a lot of I think I met some of the best guys I ever met in my life out there. Like for sure. Like uh, I met some nice guys at at Second Battalion, Second Marines, but like the guys that I felt like at Banger were just seem to be like like nowadays I, f- I felt like everyone's doing well yeah and so that I, th- I think that place turned out some really good men yeah I don't, I don't know what it is like I, I look back on it and I see some some guys in my uh, you know in the in second battalion second Marines and they're doing well no no one's doing bad I'm not trying to say that at all but like the guys that in that I was with in second platoon all seem to be doing really well like they're they, that place and, and 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 in that time had turned out some really really good men. Yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know. And well, I, I some think of the I think know. it's just just the program, the structure of training and everything on how they uh, develop you, um, just all the way from yeah. you know just from orientation, um, you know, and, and then you know, I mean, shit, dude, we you know you had a spit shine your boots, you had yeah. to, like there there wasn't no fucking wearing no bullshit faded camis with holes and yeah so you know they they pretty much from the get-go uh, turned us into really squared away marines you know yeah and then i think i translated into t- after like you i look at some of the guys and i was like yeah everyone's like doing well like you know some are doing better than others obviously like as, as that happens but like everyone's everyone seems to be you know no one's no one's like working a walmart job and yeah. <laughs> What squad were you in? Fourth. Fourth squad. <laughs> Fourth. Squad. Yeah. Um, Fourth with Finn. Were you there? 
you, you were there during that V150 rollover? I was on vacation. You were on vacation? That day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That was a bummer. Like, I remember getting a call about it. And I, I would, I, it was, it would have been my post. It would have been, I would have been on duty at that time because that was, uh, my squad was on duty at, uh, on post at that time. And so I didn't even know what to think of that. Yeah. Merkel and Paige. Yeah. I remember always, I don't remember Paige so much, but I do remember Merkel a lot. And I just remember, I remember. Well, for those that don't know, why don't you explain what happened um, uh, or, that, or what you can remember? Yeah. So, um, Merkel Paige, uh, I'm guessing Paige was a driver. I don't remember. Uh, no, I, no Ray, Ray, Ray was the driver. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, they they had taken a turn too sharply, uh, just going to deploy for a react force, and it had rolled over. I think uh, I think Merkel had gotten he was in the 240 turret and gotten crushed, and then Paige was. Uh, I'm not sure where he was. I wasn't there. Yeah. I just remember hearing the news, and I was I remember coming back being sad, and everyone was just sad. But, uh, like, but they both lost their lives. To yeah. That, to that both, both passed away from that rollover. Uh, one thing I remember about Merkel was, I'd like to say he was from South Dakota. I remember. Yeah. And I just remember him being a big corn fed dude. Big old guy, man. Big old guy. I remember what I remember about him is, uh, we had that, that CCI training with Sergeant law. <laughs> And he just rolled everyone up. He was just so big and strong. And it, and I think the only reason he lost was because he f rolled up like fifteen guys in a row. Yeah. It was it was like it was like a every, everyone. He basically rolled up everyone and made them all tap out. And then like one guy comes in after he went like fifteen straight and taps him out. Yeah. At, at the point where he can't <laughs> even lift his arms yeah, anymore. Yeah. 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 It was. It was. I was like, and I just remember thinking. So I was like, damn, this guy's. This guy's a fucking beast. <laughs> there you go, motherfucker. I remember. Yeah. I remember Josh, man. Josh Merkel. Yeah. Um, Paige, Paige was. I remember skinny guy. Yeah. Um, so where where did you uh, where'd you go from? Well, actually, were you in Banger during nine uh, eleven? I was. I remember nine eleven. We. Uh, I remember waking up six a.m. because the planes had hit about nine, and uh, I remember. At that time, Sergeant Peterson, um, he was Gunny, Gunny Peterson now, retired. And uh, I just remember him waking us up. And, 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 and I, re I remember being angry. Not like super angry, but just like, I want to, you know, I want to go to work. And that was kind of like the attitude. I remember going on base patrol for about a week or two. I remember being tired. But yeah, September 11th hit. And everyone was just like, kind of like, got a little bit more serious. Everyone took their job a little more serious. Wanted to, uh, I wouldn't say so much as exact revenge, but solve that problem. Right. You know, we're not just out there to, to um, kill people just for the fun of it, but just to, you know, solve a problem. And, and that became a problem. Right. Um, where did you go from Banger? From Banger, I uh, got assigned, let's see. Uh, let's see. I, I I had joined Banger in April, so I was leaving it. I think I remember leaving in April, and I think I got my orders to Second Battalion, Second Marines in Camp Lejeune. Maybe about a month before I I was actually leaving, and so I got those orders, and so I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina alone. Um, was roommates with uh, this goofy motherfucker named Jacob Peef. <laughs> you racked up with JP, huh? I racked up with JP. God damn it. And so... Um, what company were you? I was with... Um, at that time, it was called Echo Company. And so the interesting thing about that company was we had uh, a mess night every year. And so on a mess night, um, it was just the company. No one else was allowed to... to uh, no one else was invited unless you were... Um, you couldn't bring your spouse unless they were a Marine. And so, uh, they, they did this every year and they had a particular individual. I cannot remember his first name, but I do remember his last name. His name, uh, was Mr. Schultz and Mr. Schultz was with EC company, second battalion, second Marines, battle of Tarawa. 
probably one of the toughest battles you probably could have faced as a Marine. That, and, I mean, they were all, they were all pretty damn tough out in uh, World War II. And so he had visited us and I guess he came out every year for, for that company. And uh, back in World War II, it was known as Easy Company. And so from that mess night forward, the, our battalion commander uh, said, we are now known as Easy Company and we will not be known as anything other than that from then forward. Hmm. So that's why now it's Easy Company. You used to, all, all companies and all comp company E's in, in, in the Marine Corps, I think are Echo Company, except for that one. Wow. I don't that know was that. kind of yeah. That was kind of a cool story. He was a mortarman, weapons platoon, track yeah. company, just like us. Yeah, we were a track company uh, on that deployment, and um, he was the same exact thing. And he was a very humble guy. He said it was he. He he said uh, they had it easy because they had five guys to a mortar system where we only had three. Yeah, I didn't believe him. Hmm. <laughs> um, what what uh, what rank did you? Uh, Go over the two two as I I I had picked up corporal, right on first squad. So I was attached to first platoon, easy company most most of my time. So you got there. You said in May, went overseas, uh, pumped out in uh, August two thousand two. Um, what was it like? Um, what was that tour like for you? That was a it was an interesting deployment. We had a lot of missions, a lot of offloads. Uh, I think we offloaded in Kosovo or Greece, and then we moved on to Kosovo. That was that was a, a like a peacekeeping mission. I just remember being cold out there all the time. Like I remember it raining and being cold, um, and it was uh, it. We had fun with it as best as we could. I remember being in an outpost. On a on a mountainside, and we going on. A, our team was tasked with just doing these LPOP, listening post observation posts, out there on the hillside, and um, we had a, we would have a team of, of four guys, and we would go out and just do these LPOPs like overnight. Um, come out. Uh, I think I remember them warning us about like minefield. I remember. Oh, I remember uh, one time we were out there and we had set up a LPOP and we're supposed to be discreet and quiet. And so we're sitting there on the hillside and no one's supposed to know we're there, but apparently the locals knew we were there. And so this lady comes up with uh, a fresh baked bread. And so according to our interpreter, the, the local populace was Muslim. And so they were... Uh, on, they were being oppressed by some of the uh, Serbian people that were in were in charge or were in the area, and so they were happy we were there protecting them, and they were really uh, they didn't understand why we were there at first, but eventually they saw that we were there to to help them, and this lady uh, comes down the hillside and brings up some fresh baked bread, like it was still hot, and I remember we were getting it and and and. We didn't know what to do with it because we didn't want to eat any poison food or anything like that. We were just like, "Why well, is she bringing us bread?" But the interpreter had assured us that it was good. Like, don't worry, they're not. They know you're here for for good intentions and stuff, and they're not trying to. They they like you here, and so I just remember being on a cold hillside, getting fresh break bread, <laughs> and then I think so. We did the LPOPs on some occasions, and then other occasions we were doing like. Uh, like uh, 16 kilometer patrols. It wasn't too bad. Like just just patrolling, nothing crazy. Just just walking around, seeing the local populace, and the interpreter would tell us like they're not used to us like patrolling on foot. Like normally, I think the German army was in charge, and they would be patrolling in in, in their vehicles and just driving. So I think I think the people there felt really secure and. And actually, when I was there, we had a, a, a dinner, and they had um, we had a dinner with the German the German general in charge, the NATO general in charge. He was, I think, I, I can't remember if he was like a brigadier or, or major general, but he came up to our campsite, a uh, little little um, little campsite, and he, uh, <laughs> I remember they made it look so fancy. They had some <laughs> try to dress up MREs as much as you could <laughs> dress up MREs, and we 
we're eating Emery, which is German general. And, but he did mention that the, um, the smuggling had stopped, virtually had stopped. Like all, all the, like whatever, whatever it was that you were smuggling. I, mean, I, can't, I can't remember, maybe it was guns, maybe it was drugs or something like that, but it, like it had virtually stopped while we were there. Hmm. I don't know, I'm pretty sure you remember that, that time period, but yeah, he had told us that. Yeah. I don't think I ever shared that with anyone. Yeah. Um, so where'd you go from Kosovo? So, so after that, we had, we got, a, I think we were there for about a month or so. Got back on our boats, went to Djibouti. Um, Africa. Djibouti, Africa, uh, the Horn of Africa. It's like north east. It would be northeast Africa, right next to Somalia. And um, I'm not sure what everyone else did, but I was attached to first platoon, and our platoon um, got attached with a bunch of seal t- uh, a seal team. We were we, we became like under the uh, direction of a SEAL team and so I remember like there was like a few of them and so they were we were training doing like fast roping out of CH-53s and and all sorts of like kind of high speed training with the SEALs and they were I think they were basically inserting into Somalia uh, so these sniper teams to get whatever it is they needed to get some intel and then we were their REAC force and so I'm not sure what the rest of our company was doing, but that's what uh, we did as first platoon. So we did that for like a month of just training with them. And it was, it was really cool. We, we actually got to fire off like different weapon systems um, while we were there with the SEALs. And they were, they were just kind of um, helping us out. And I remember it was a first name basis with right. them. <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't a petty officer, whatever. It was Mike. I remember what I remember the corpsman was named was the smallest guy of their whole unit was the corpsman who had probably had to carry the most weight was Mike mm-hmm. Mike Watts I'll never forget it um so were you were you how long were you overseas for I think it was a I think it was a nine month deployment yeah um so, so you were you were over there during the invasion of Iraq yeah after after Djibouti we had I mean it was nice we had a couple of port stops Seychelles. I'll never forget that. Uh, snorkeling out there. That was fun. And then uh, I remember getting the call over the, the PA system for the on the ship saying uh, our, 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 and our deployment had been extended indefinitely and that we were offloading all the Marines into Kuwait. I remember that distinctly. And so then, um, yeah, it just became, let's get getting down to business. We kind of knew what we were there for. We were about to invade and, and all that stuff. So, and so how'd that go? Yeah, it was it was just interesting. It was it was like everything was always kind of nerve wracking. You never knew what was going to happen, and so I guess that uncertainty of always being in a tough situation and how you're going to react. Um, I just uh, I remember getting there. It was it was daytime. We landed, and. Uh, we got we offloaded and I remember walking a lot initially trying to get to, to wherever we needed to go and then and then I think we got down to business I think we started um, we started getting in five tons and and going I remember attacking us uh, some city I don't even know what city it was I'd like to say Nazaria but maybe it was a, maybe another city but I do distinctly remember one of them I think I don't think I think it was Fox Company was like assaulting and we were base of fire or something like that that was like one of the things i remember it's all kind of fuzzy because i remember being so tired and so sleepy because we were always on 50 50 watch so one man up one man sleeping and so it was always like you're always tired and it was hot it was hot and you were mopped up hot tired yeah, full chemical suit. It's like who wears a who wears like a snowboard jacket in the middle of the desert, um, moving. You know, there's no there's no there was no base. There's no like place you could go to call home. Home was wherever you dug your hole. It's like what's a shower? What's the you know? Mm-hmm. So it was it was at that time. It's like you just do what you got to do. You look back on it you're like how did I ever get through that? But at, 
you know, at that time, it's like you, you do what you need to do, especially for, and I do remember distinctly remembering, like, you didn't want to let anyone down more so than anything. It's like, I would rather be sleepy than fall asleep and something bad happen. Fall asleep on my watch and bed, something bad happen. Yeah. Um, anything bad, did anything ever bad happen to you guys while you're out there? I mean, we got shot at and things like that. I mean, just, I don't, I don't, I don't think we had it like as bad as, 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 as other units and, and whatnot. Like I know some units got hit hard. Our unit, um, I, like you just, you just kind of deal with it. I don't, I don't think it's any terrible. I, I look back on it. I think maybe. I know for sure some units had it worse, but, um, and I know maybe we had it worse than others, but I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think in terms of that, like, I don't think it, like, I don't think like, oh, we had it, we had it worse off than you or, or anything like that. It's just like, everyone's kind of there to do their job. And so like, just people kind of do their job. Yeah. No matter what. And it's like, it's just luck of the draw. Um, while you were there, did you, uh, interact with any of the locals um i remember coming across them i think at one point uh they would uh they would come up to us like um especially kind of it kind of tapered tapered like as the invasion drew on it kind of tapered down the uh, the the combat that was going on and stuff and i remember the the, the locals like interacting with you to the extent that um I, we were in southern Iraq, and so they were kind of happy that to be kind of free of that, free of the dictatorship. I'm guessing they were probably fairly oppressed. And I remember them crowds coming out. I remember passing out like some of our candies from the MREs to some of the kids, and 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 um, most of them couldn't speak English, obviously, but they could they could say some words. I remember that they would always say like, "Hey, Mister. Hey, Mister." That was one of the, that's how they would kind of like call you. And basically they were wanting like candy or something. And so you give them, I would always try and give them whatever I had. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I remember, um, I remember the kids mostly. I think at that, at that time, my, um, my uh, wife at that time was, was pregnant. And so that's probably why I was out, it probably sticks out in my head mm. were the kids. Cause yeah. I was always thinking of that. Uh, do you recall seeing any, uh, any traumatic events, you know, while you're out there? Any, um, yeah, maybe on a convoy or? Uh, I mean, anything? just what you would think would happen in, in, in a war situation. You know, people getting shot, mostly the enemy, none, none of us. We were, we were a pretty highly trained unit at that time. You know, we had gone through a whole workup. And so a lot of the guys had been, already been in for a couple a couple years at least. You know, there was like... So everyone was was up to speed of how to react. We didn't have any like fresh boots and stuff. So, I mean, it was it was mostly the enemy. Yeah, they were on the the receiving end. Our our end was was pretty good. We were we were a pretty good unit. Yeah, well, I think we were probably uh, one of the most trained units out there at that time. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I don't. I think most people wouldn't say like, uh, you know, just seeing people get shot and just not us. And like, I don't think, you know, the majority of humans wouldn't say that's normal. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, um, uh, normal in the sense of wartime people are going to get shot. Yeah. 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 I know. I hear you, but uh, yeah. Um, so how, when did you get, come back? I'm not, or, you know what? Summer, what, what? summer, summer of 03, we came back. Um, yeah. I just, one of the things I remember was, uh, having to like get all our, like we, we had been in the field for so long, we had to set out all our stuff. And so they had to like inspect our, our gear and um, make sure we weren't like taking any, any per, uh, like contraband back to the United States and stuff. And, and I remember I, I, some gunnery sergeant had seen me, he said, oh, you're a sergeant. Easy, you just pack your stuff and put it away. And I was like, "Oh man, <laughs> I got took up so much, <laughs> mm -hmm. so much goodies up here." But yeah, uh, yeah, we got back on we got back on the boat and 
went home. I think it was about, what, a month? A month to get back home? Something like that? Something like that. But um, how long did you stay in after you got back? See, I had gotten... My, my, when did you get out my, of the Marines? August 30... August 30... August 30th was my last day. Of 03? Of 03, yeah. And uh, what, what was it like? What was the, can you talk to me about what the transition was like for you getting out of the military and then moving into civilian life? Yeah. So, uh, got out. Um, I had, uh, well, I came back from Iraq I, and then I think we went on, on, on a leave. And so I came back, I, my daughter was born, she was already born. And so I came to her and then, um, we were on leave for a couple weeks. Came back to, um, at the, my wife at that time, we had come back to North Carolina. I told her like, why don't you just come out with me? I had a couple months left and you're on summer break from school. So, so she agreed. So we came out, um, and, I uh, just kind of lived out the remainder of our time in, 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 in North Carolina until I, until I separated. And so after I separated, I came back home. I had thought about becoming a police officer. And I kind of went through some of the interviews. It didn't. It didn't really work out. It didn't pan out like I thought it would. And then I, I went to school, and I was going to the local community college. I was working. I got a job as a janitor at a middle school. And so at nights I was going. At nights I was doing the middle uh, middle school janitor route, and then during the days I was going to school. So I'd wake up. I would wake up, go to school for take a couple classes. And then I would go uh, do my janitor job at night. And so I did that for a number of years. And um, what was the transition like for you um, transitioning into civilian life coming from a military environment? I think it was tough. It wasn't what I expected. I remember always being angry, angry with the angry with uh, at my at the wife, at my wife at the time, like just little things. And so little things kind of irritated me, like a little bit of, I guess you could say PTSD. I would, kind of seems silly for me to say, to have that, but I guess it was, it was that. But uh, like, I remember always, um, not always being angry, but getting angry at little, like kind of small stuff at that time. And, and the transition was kind of, kind of difficult. And so like, I mean, at the, like, the job I had at that time kind of gave me my alone time. That probably helped a little bit, but um, my relationship with my uh, with my wife at the time kind of deteriorated over the years, and and it it, it, it obviously it ended up working out. We ended up divorcing, but it was that 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 part was a little tough. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean after after transitioning out. Uh, to to that life, it was just uh, yeah, it was just tough. Did you uh, did you seek any type of help for? I did. I went to the VA, but I got very frustrated with them. It was just always like I would ask to. They would have me see a psychologist, and I, I felt like they always kind of put me with a different psychologist, and so I was always seeing someone different every time, and I got really frustrated with it, and I just kind of stopped going to that. And so for, there was a number of years there where I didn't see anyone, but, um, eventually I, I, I think I would always come back to the VA eventually kind of like a toxic ex <laughs> 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 um, because where else are you going to go? So yeah. Did they, uh, VA diagnose you with PTSD? Yes, they did. Oh. So it turns out that stuff you were feeling then was, was, you know, yeah, I get, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. No one's ever said that. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never had it put to me like that. So what I was feeling, I guess, was correct. Right. Um, and how, how are you managing that these days? These days, I am doing pretty well with it. Like, I, I, I decided not to be ang angry, not to be sad. Um, and, you know, I'm alive. So that's a bonus. And I got, um, you know, I got a beautiful daughter that, uh, I always think about, um, good life, you know, uh, beautiful sister, sisters, 
and my brother. And so like things aren't so bad. Awesome. I don't have to like, why rely on the negativity when you could rely on the positivity? And so I kind of like turned that around maybe a couple years ago. And so everything's like really good for That's me. That's great. Um, I don't even like, yeah, you kind of think about kind of some of the bad stuff that happened probably out there, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect me at all anymore. That's good. Um, what, what, what do you think made that change? Like, what, what would you say to somebody that might be struggling with that, that maybe wants to get to mm -hmm. the point where you're at now? How could they get there? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, or what would you do to get there, at least? Kind of realizing that you, that there are good things. Like I, I, I had a lot of good things going for me, you know, and I just wasn't, I didn't have my eyes open to it. Like my, like my, I, I love my sister like a lot. And so she kind of helped me a lot. I mean, I don't think she realizes it, but she, she's helped me like a ton. Like, uh, I look at her, I think I see her as like, she's someone I, I would strive to be, you know? just super like she's successful she's smart she she has a control of her emotions and so i was like i was like you know i had to remember who the fuck i was like you're a fucking marine you did all this stuff you don't have to be down in the dumps it's like you know stand up do what you need to do to 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 to, to be happy and it's kind of kind of that attitude of like you know it's not it's not worth it to to be down in the dumps right it's like you you're you're tough you're you you're you've been through worse you you're tough enough to 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 do what you need to do to be happy and so it was kind of like kind of that attitude and it's like anyone that's kind of struggling i know it's kind of tough to hear but like you could do it like just um i, I mean it's good to have a good support group and i'm kind of like spoiled in that sense when I have, you know, I have people like my sister and whatnot, but, um, there's, there's always someone there. You gotta find, you have to find that person. It was just so happened to be someone like my sister. That's awesome. Um, all right, we're going to get ready to wrap it up, but, um, you know, before we do that, I just want to, uh, I just want to ask, you know, what, what did it, what's it feel like for you to sit down and, and, uh, tell your story like this yeah, i was nervous at first i was nervous all the way up here uh i didn't know what to expect um but it, it does feel a little bit refreshing yeah a bit refreshing yeah what do you think uh about this project we have going on for urban valor i think it's pretty good like um watch a bit of mike's video uh i think it'll probably do some good i i uh i would encourage like a lot of veterans to come out and and, and talk like uh however whatever job you did whatever you did in the military it's like just get it out there get your voice out there and and, and i think uh there'll be a lot of good things that'll come your way yeah um awesome man well uh thanks for being here and uh thanks for your service brother thank you push it to the limit i can't go no more red light no way i'm coming back home long dirt road all on my own i'm gonna be the greatest draw my name in the stone Run my name in the stone yeah, I'm coming back.